<laughs> All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, with the number of people here, I'm sure that everybody has heard all about Brooke and her wonderful Reclaim the Records. And um, who is a modern heroine of genealogy. But um, I'm thrilled to introduce her. Um, she is founder of Reclaim the Records, a not for profit act not for profit activist group that uses state freedom of information requests to return genealogical records to the public. She's the former vice president of Gesha Galizia. She designed and built their website, including its innovative All Galizia database. Um, the underlying search engine code base called LeafSeek was released by Brooke as a free open source project, and she won the 2012 Roots Tech Developer Challenge for this, which is sorry, second place. Still pretty awesome. Um, and she then refined it to build the bilingual All Israel database for the um, Israel Genealogical Research Association. She lives in California, and I will turn it over to her to tell us all about the wonderful things she's doing for the genealogical community. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to be standing over here and then speaking over there a little bit. I'm so glad you could all join me. I'm so psyched for this talk. Um, I have a lot of material to cover. I apologize if I speak quickly. I am a New Yorker, as you will learn in this. And I've had my coffee, and I have a lot of ground to cover. So if you could please hold your questions to the end. I will try to talk to everyone. I am here through Sunday. You can always grab me in the hallways. Reclaim the records. Using freedom of information laws for genealogical and archival research. Uh, freedom is not free, but this is. Feel free to take pictures, tweet it, whatever. I'm going to put this entire slide deck online tomorrow morning on reclaimtherecords.org, which is our website. So do not feel the need to take notes because it'll all be there for you. Slide deck is under Creative Commons license. Hi. If you don't know me, I am Brooke Gans. I'm a genealogy nerd. I have various uh, accomplishments you can read about. Basically, I love genealogy. I especially love the intersection of genealogy and technology. Um, I love building websites for making records available. And that's one part of the problem of getting records online is the ability to publish them. But what this talk is about is about record acquisition and how to get records that you have been told are inaccessible. I grew up in New York. I was born in New York. I was married in New York. My old family's from New York. They got off the boat and they stayed in New York, except for one little branch in Connecticut, but they eventually made it to New York. And I always thought I'd be in New York too. But I married a guy from California. I met him in college, moved to California, been here ever since. And the records I want are in New York. And it is very difficult to do genealogical research from in New York from farther away, as many of you know. Every state does their own thing in terms of putting records online or not putting records online, as the case may be. And New York is uniquely difficult, which is very surprising given its prominence and the, the port of entry for so many American citizens and uh, original 13 colonies. It's very, very uh, difficult to deal with, and the organizations there are not proactive. Poland, for example, has started putting all of their birth, marriage, and death records online in lovely websites. New York State, New York City, nothing. So I love New York, okay? I'm a New Yorker in exile, but yet this talk is about how I sued them twice in the past 11 months. <laughs> so how did it come to this? Let me explain. I have a group which I created called Reclaim the Records. We are not for profit. We are not a registered nonprofit yet. I will get to that. We are a not for profit activist group. We are not a JGS where we're going to serve coffee cake. We have a virtual presence online. We are all about making records available. We want to spread the word that you can use freedom of information laws to get genealogical records released to the public. You can be an activist, not just a passive consumer of products. We want to crowdsource ideas for what are other record sets that we haven't attacked yet. There are so many out there. We want to list our future targets publicly so that everybody knows what we're up to. We want to work in the open through websites like Muckrock, which I will talk about later too. We want to be an educational resource, an advice portal. We want to talk to you over email about your ideas. And we want to be a voice for change, a voice for the individual user that is not necessarily a for-profit company or a large nonprofit, but rather individual resources, researchers whose resources are being denied to them. We have an email newsletter. You can keep up with us that way. Just sign up on reclaimtherecords.org. That's probably our lowest point of contact. Facebook, we are somewhat more active. We post a little more often. Twitter. We post a lot. It's a lot of snarky commentary. It's up to you which method you'd like to consume our news by. I leave this to you. Our, our goal, our job, is to put it online for free for everyone. That means put records online, images online, data online, tools to work with the data online. For free means free. I mean, no cost, but also no restrictions, no copyrights, no usage restrictions, no logins. And, and for everyone means anybody. 
That means that other groups are welcome to take our data and our images that we win and put them on their websites, do their own transcription projects, do an art project. I don't care. These are public records, and we want them returned to the public. Okay, that's basically what we do in a nutshell. We have hundreds of thousands of genealogical records already online and millions going online in the next few months. We have no copyrights, no restrictions. We have about 63 sets on our to-do list. We are not for profit in the sense that this is my hobby, but it has become so encompassing and large and has such a huge potential in front of it that we are strongly considering becoming a 501c3 nonprofit. If you know anything about nonprofits and you are interested in record access issues, please talk to me because we are strongly considering filing next year to become a real grown up nonprofit. Okay, highlights of today's talk. Open data, the Freedom of Information Act and various state freedom of information laws. How do you use these? How did we use these? What are some of the crazy things that happened to us along the way? I understand I'm going a little fast through these slides. I hope you'll forgive me because there is so much to cover. And like I said, these slides will all be online starting tomorrow. What you need to know is there is the way things are supposed to work and the way things they actually work. <laughs> this discrepancy is both uh, around open data policies and freedom of information laws. I need to warn you all, I am not a lawyer. This is not an excuse for talking to an actual lawyer who is educated about the freedom of information laws in your state or federal freedom of information act. I am not a lawyer, but my parents wish I were. So <laughs> I grew up in a family of lawyers. I was expected to become a lawyer. I chose my college major with the idea I'd be a lawyer. I took the LSATs, I did fine, but I just couldn't pull the trigger on actually going to law school. I just couldn't do it because I love tech. I love working in tech, and that's where I decided to go instead. And to me, tech was creative and interesting, and you could build new things. And who wanted the law? The law, you were set with what was already done, and you had to you know, work in a really narrow rule set. Who wanted that? That's what I thought. So my sister became the lawyer. It's all good. <laughs> and part of the tech world these days is something called open data. Open data is the idea that certain data sets, particularly ones produced by government entities, whether they're agencies or states or cities, whatever, these, this data should be freely available because we paid for them to use it in the, in the course of their business. Uh, this can be anything from um, uh, agricultural data to the shape files of your local school district to um, crime statistics, anything that they're producing anyway in some government agency that is paid for with your tax dollars, we ought to have a copy of that too. And that's become sort of a real theme on the internet in the past few years. Most cities have a website like this, Open Data San Francisco, Open Data Your Town or Your State. And there's even one, here's one for San Francisco where some of the ones they're highlighting are a list of every movie ever shot in San Francisco and crime reports and you know geographical locations, things like that. There's also data.gov, which is the national open data portal. And they have all sorts of interesting things too, including things like this from the social security. This is not the social security death master file or death index. This is a list of all babies' names that have applied for a social security card from like 1880 to the present. So you might think, what does anybody do with this data? Well, if you publish on your site a list of all the crimes, someone might make an app showing what areas are safer to live in than others. If you publish uh, the shape files for your school districts, you might know when you're browsing like Zillow or Redfin, oh, this house I'm looking at is in this school district. Well, they know that from using this data for, that the country or the, the city or the state puts out. So for example, this database, I guess Social Security just does it for fun, like what are the top 10 most popular names this year? But people remix data when it's open. They remix it and they make cool new stuff like the baby name Voyager, which I used when I was looking for names for my children born in 2007, 2010. This is uh, updated through 2014 and because the data is open, you can use it in ways it wasn't intended to be used. In this case, it was, oh, Emma and other old fashioned names are really making a comeback. Emma, Sadie, Pearl, Ruby, all these names you can see on this graph, just they start coming back. And then there's the names that aren't coming back. <laughs> so you can see open data, you can do really cool stuff. So I thought originally, I had no idea about the freedom of information laws. I thought, why don't I make an open data request for New York genealogical data? Because I want it. I live in California. I am tired of having to write them emails or, or letters to which they maybe respond. And if they do, it could be the wrong record and they don't respond in a timely manner. And I, I, they're not going to put it online some other way. Why don't I use this great new open data tool? So I made a request on their open data portal in New York City back in 2013. 
and they never responded to it. And I tracked down the people who worked on open data in New York City on Twitter and on email and on the phone, and I talked to them, and they all said, yeah, this sounds great, yeah, we could probably send that online. It never happened, because the problem with the open data laws is they are ambitious, but they don't have teeth in them if you don't comply. If a person requests a data set and it's not getting put online, nothing really happens. There is no teeth. So this was really bumming me out because I picked tech over law because tech was going to make great things happen. And tech was lying to me and it was not putting things online. And this is when I realized maybe I should have been a lawyer. <laughs> it's a fleeting thought, but it did occur to me. So that's when I realized I'm going to use the law as a layperson. <laughs> So I learned about the Freedom of Information Act and state-level freedom of information laws, and that's really what we're going to talk about here today. Now, this is sort of the main list of what you need to do to use these laws. I know it sounds complicated, but if I can figure this out, you all can figure this out. You have to find out what records that I want even exist in the first place. And honestly, that is sometimes the hardest question because there are places like the New York City Municipal Archives who do not publish an index of what they hold. They are like a restaurant that doesn't give you the menu. And there are a lot of places like this where you don't even know what they have and maybe they weren't thought of as genealogical records but they're useful to you and the finding aids are not really connected to the broader genealogy community and there's a lot of problems like that. So you should know what exists that potentially I could use. Who has them? Are, are they part of the government? And don't get tripped up by that because you can't use the Freedom of Information Law or Act on a non-government agency. You can't go after, like, I've had people email me about the Archdiocese of New York, and I'm like, sorry, can't help you. I can't help you for your private cemetery or groups like that. It has to be a government agency. You have to know what law applies. Are these records actually withheld? Are they withheld by some other law, not really FOIL? And who can help you on your, on your goal, on, to, on your path to find this goal? So, let's talk about FOIA versus FOIL. FOIA with the A at the end is the famous one. This is for federal agencies. This is the one you hear about in the news all the time. It is for the Justice Department. It is for Hillary Clinton's emails. It is recently uh, updated slightly by President Obama. We all use FOIA all the time and you don't even know it. When you're getting copies of the SS5, somebody's original social security application, which often has their mother's maiden name, very useful, you're using FOIA technically on the back end for naturalization records through the USCIS portal, technically using FOIA, things like that. So you're kind of using it, but you don't really know you're using it. What I've been using so far is not FOIA, it is FOIL, which is the state level laws. Every state and DC has their own law. They're mostly the same from state to state. Some are a little better than others. Um, they all have their own names. Utah's law has the best name, it is Grandma, G-R-A-M-A. <laughs> They might be known as sunshine laws or open records laws. Most of these are about 40 years old. Most of them came into being around the time of Watergate, mostly because of Watergate. And they allow people in the state to have access to their government's information, what is being done with your money and in your name. There are 51 different laws because there's 50 states plus DC. This is a great website to be able to learn more. This is Ballotpedia. It's like Wikipedia, but for election and uh, um, uh, public debate, things like that. It has m more information about each one of these laws you can click through. Making one of these requests is free, which how often do you hear about something free in genealogy? Not that often. If you need to appeal a denial, also free. A few of them, if they are not listening to your denial, you can sometimes go to an ombudsman or a panel instead of going to court. I keep going to court because that's where we end up. Um, but if you go to court, you can often get your money back if you win the records. Not always, but sometimes. 47, about to be 48 states have that option. If you can prove the records were wrongfully withheld, you can usually get your attorney's fees, which means you basically got all this stuff done for free, just a lot of service. Um, in five states, if you win, you're you're automatically you get your money back, and that is California, Colorado, Florida, Illinois, and New Jersey. And a couple states, like Maryland, if they really mess up and they were absolutely withholding for no good cause, they get fined. That sounds, I haven't used that yet. <laughs> Who can you FOIL? You send a records request to an agency. An agency, at least in New York, is a state or municipal department, et cetera, et cetera. Anybody who took tax money to exist, basically. Most states are pretty similar in what they call an agency, and every agency has a FOIL officer. If you go on most state or city government websites, you will often see a page somewhere, usually on the Contact Us page, like who is their FOIL officer? What is their FOIL email address to ask them questions? Um, 
in New York State and several other states, judicial records and state legislature records are exempt, sometimes governor records too. It, then these are sort of the minutiae you have to look into for your own state compared to other states. That means, from a genealogical point of view, a stuff like adoption files, court cases, divorce, case, divorce cases, name changes, naturalization, that's all done in the courts. So I can't fi file FOIL for those. I can use other laws to get copies of those. In New York, there's a judicial law 255. Other states have their own laws. There are other ways to get records too, but you, know, you have to know what are the limits of this freedom of information law you're using. We have some workarounds. This is the best part of FOIL. You only pay the actual costs of copying. You're not asking for a favor, you're asking for a copy. And you pay the actual costs. When I won records from New York City Municipal Archives, I got them for $35 a microfilm roll, which is the actual cost of copying a microfilm roll. I had to pay for shipping, and they could have charged me a little bit for the labor to produce that, but only at the rate of the lowest paid person who worked there who was capable of doing the labor. They didn't charge me for labor. So this is a really nice way to get like millions of records for relatively little money if you get to the point where they finally send you the invoice, because the invoice will be the actual costs. Another thing to note about FOIL, if you're talking to an archive or a library and you're like, I know you have tax records, or I know you have the chauffeur's licenses from the city from the 1930s, and I want a copy. They have to give it to you in whatever format they have it. You cannot tell them, could you please index all of that and turn it into a database and send me like a lovely formatted database? <laughs> Not gonna work. So the records I've been getting, generally, they were only in microfilm in the first place, so I had to get the microfilm copies, and I found someone very nice I'll talk about later, to copy them to digital image for me. But if they have them in paper copies, if you know they have paper copies, you can usually ask them under most laws for either paper copies, for which they can only charge you usually 10 cents a copy, or you can ask for scans for slightly more money. So, you know, you have to sort of see what they have, and they have to deliver. Okay, I'm going to go a little fast just because I want to get to the meat of some of the stuff we won. When you are looking for records, you have to know their parent agency. When I had the, was looking for records from the New York City Municipal Archives, the parent agency is not the archives, the parent agency is something called DORIS, D-O-R-I-S, Department of Records and Information Services. So when you maybe bring a lawsuit, you need to know who you're actually dealing with. Um, if you're looking for birth or death, it might be with the health department. There might be a second copy kept somewhere else before they had to do with the state copy or the state registration. Marriages and divorces might be under the judiciary. As we said, judiciary is sometimes not covered by FOIL. depends on your, on your state. You need to find out the parent agency. Uh, if something's in an archive or a library, it might be Department of Education who you're looking for. Even though really it's a library, you're really dealing with the Department of Ed. It's weird. City clerk's offices are tricky because they might have dual functions. They may function as, yes, I'm the clerk for such and such county, but I have records that are not judicial. I have records that are um, like a list of everyone buried in the local city cemetery, which happens sometimes, or some other record that is not a judicial record that is their other work-related things, and those can be open. What can you not ask for? You cannot ask for anything that's already been absolutely ruled out by a state legislature or a federal law. But basically nothing that's like too in intrusive on people's privacy. That's basically the rule. Um, that could be crime victim information, judicial records, educational records, governor's office. Um, for a real life version of how this affects people in Michigan, they are considering changing their state's freedom of information law so it does cover their governor's office to deal with the Detroit, uh, uh, the Flint water issue, things like that. These, these what is available and what is not available has very real consequences in terms of what kind of records you can ask for. Can you just FOIL a certificate? No. And this is why. Because they have laws saying, oh, for a copy of a birth certificate, you need to be X number of years old and or you need to be a relative and you have to prove it already that you're a relative. They can set that. They're allowed to say, you know, I don't like it, but they're allowed to say only these people and these times can have a record for a specific certificate. However, can you FOIL an index? Yes, almost always, at least I found so far, because the index is usually an extract they made for their own use so they can find the certificate. The certificates have all sorts of rules and registrations and requirements, but the index was a government-created record. So why not go after the index? Seems like it's been working. Can you FOIL another type of records index? Probably, yes. If they made their own database, like in 
access or something on their own computer to look up something just for their own personal you know, use in the office. They made it on a government computer for government records on government time. You can probably FOIL that. Can you FOIL for the right to just view an informational copy, not like get a real certificate which implies paper, but can you use FOIL just to view it if there aren't any other outstanding you know, privacy restrictions? Maybe. We haven't tried this yet, but it's something I want to work on in the next year. There are many states, for example, where all death certificates that are older than 50 years old are considered open to the public. Anyone can write in and get one but you're still writing in buying a certificate and they're allowed to sell it to you because they have a fee structure. Well, what I want to know is all of those are kept on microfilm. Can I FOIL a copy of the microfilm? I'm not FOILing, I'm not asking for the certificate. I'm asking for the microfilm, which is a different type of record. It's not a certificate till it's on paper. I don't know, let's find out. <laughs> okay, once you know their parent agency, find the name and contact for their FOIL officer, you write them a nice email. And you can submit everything in a FOIL request through email, through postal mail, or my favorite, muckrock.com. Super helpful, muckrock.com, as in muckrake, but muckrock, haha. They are a clearinghouse for freedom of information requests in terms of uh, Freedom of Information Act, federal, and also every state. Um, every little agency is basically in their database. If not, they'll add one for you. And you can see, create a FOIA request in the top right-hand corner in the blue button. That also applies to FOIL, to state-level requests. They are starting to do news stories basically every day on things that are cool. Every time someone famous do dies, they FOIA his federal you know, FBI records, see if there was anything interesting. They basically are a great way just to learn about all this. And if you want to create a request, um, they will let you make an account for free. They gave me like a higher pro account for free, which was nice of them. You basically create a request. I want this thing. In the white area, you put down, give me this thing, and you, you explain more. I'll tell you what to write there in a minute. You tell what city it's going to and what agency within that city or state. And they'll send it to the right person, and they will use their from address on all the mail or email. It'll all be coming from a specific ID number at their muckrock headquarters in Boston. So you're not giving up your address or anything like that. So it's nice to have a little privacy like that. It's also a great way to organize your requests. If you're someone like me who starts sending out a lot of requests and you need to or see, like, do they respond to that yet? Where is that? Is that on appeal? They'll let you see everything organized and who it's going to and what was the last time you heard from them. And that's really helpful just to keep things involved. If somebody doesn't respond to your FOIA request, they'll start keep emailing them every two weeks. Please respond. Please respond. <laughs> they, will, they will help you. And that is really something you want to get involved with. Okay, secret sauce. What do you write when you are writing a Freedom of Information Law or Freedom of Information Act request? Hi, my name is Brookshire Gans, and I'm making a records request under... Muckrock will fill in the next part. They'll tell you what law, because they saw what state you were sending it to, and they'll tell you what you should be listing. I am seeking... Give an example of what you're seeking. In this case, I want the New York State Death Index from this state to this state. And I'll explain just like a sentence or two. I think this should be online because... Don't give them your life story. Don't rail at them for being idiots, even if they are. Just sort of say explicitly what you want and give a start and end date. Make it as specific as possible and make it as hard as possible for them to mess up because they will. You may need to say in some places, I'm a private individual, not a for-profit company. Fine, stick that in. In a very, very small number of states, including Virginia, you might need to say, I'm a legal resident of this state. If you are looking for Virginia records and you are not a Virginia resident, there are ways at Muckrock to find a proxy filer for you. And you tell them what format you want the records in. I want microfiche, fiche, microfilm, database. If you know the records are paper, you could say I want paper copies or I want scans. I'm willing to pay up to, stick a number in there, and to contact me first before you start copying. That's basically it. This is basically the whole thing you have to write and that's it. And I know you all can write letters. And there are example letters on Muckrock you can search through, hundreds of them. Other ways to help yourself. Most states have organizations that can help you with questions. They might be aimed a little more towards journalists, but some are really good for the public. This one, I got so lucky that New York has this amazing website called the Committee on Open Government. It's basically three guys in an office, or one guy, one woman, and an admin, in an office in Albany, funded by the legislature. They actually get funding to help people in New York 
file requests. And they post all this stuff online about all their previous advisory opinions, what they thought about previous cases. And they break them down, not just alphabetically, but by subject matter. And not just by subject matter, but they have separate entries there for marriage records versus matrimonial records, which I didn't know was a distinction, but apparently is. And you can read through what they've said about other people's requests, and you can just absorb and learn what they did and what didn't work also. And you can figure out, oh, zip codes are probably fine in a database. They can't cut out the zip code. You, know, you can learn about what is okay for your request. And your state probably has something like this or an organization of journalists who can do pretty much the same thing. As I said, there are 51 different laws. You can just go through and pick the one you want to learn about. But there are 57 different vital records jurisdictions, because that's 50 states, plus DC, plus the territories, plus New York City, which is considered like a state, separate from the rest of the United States. So I'm in this weird situation where I have a New York background, and I live across the country, and New York City and New York State have totally separate vital records laws, totally separate, both convoluted ways of getting records, but legally I only have to learn one law, which is the New York State Freedom of Information Law, the 40-year-old law. So if I learn this one law, I might get records from both areas, Westchester County, where I grew up, and New York City, where all my ancestors grew up. This sounds good. So I start making lists of who has all these things in every state. New York State, Department of Health has birth, marriage, death. Clerks may have copies of birth, marriage, of birth, marriage, and death in the index. Department of Education runs the archives in the library, and the court system, I'm kind of out of luck, because it, FOIL doesn't, in New York doesn't cover the court system. New York City, a little different. Department of Health does birth and death, but the city clerk does the marriages and the civil union records and the index. All the cool old stuff ends up in the municipal archives, New York City Department of Records and the municipal archives. That's all the old certificates, old indexes. Again, court system I can't really use. So I'm like, all right, I am so fed up with having to not get any records out of New York, I'm going to use the freedom of information law in New York to get records out of them, because that stuff is old. And it's probably the smallest number of reasons for them to say no to me, So I thought. So at this point, I'm like thinking like strategy. Okay, I can't use these open data policies. They're well-meaning tech triumphalism. They don't actually do anything yet. They need better training, better teeth in the law. I'm going to have to go on states where there's good case law, where there's people who can help me, like the Committee on Open Government, where I might be able to get my attorney's fees back. And some states, you can even apply for a fee waiver if you can prove you're doing it in the public interest. I don't know anyone who's ever proven to a, a board that genealogy is in the public interest, but I think we have a really good shot at saying that. We are the second largest um, online uh, hobby. I think you all know what the first is. <laughs> I want new records. I don't want to go after anything that's already on family search microfilm or ancestry. I want stuff that nobody has because I just, I, I'm sick of this that they're not doing anything proactive. I want to go after old stuff because this way they're not going to slap, you know, slap me down with privacy laws. And I want to build on my win because if this works, oh man, I want to go get more records and I want to use the same way of doing it. So pick the low hanging fruit first. That was my idea. So. New York Department of Records and Municipal Archives, I choose you. I wrote a, a last message on January 5th, but it was really my, my New Year's resolution. This is to Tracing the Tribe. Shout out to a great Facebook group for Jewish genealogy. New Year's resolution, no more Mr. Nice Guy, no more humbly beseeching governmental entities that hold genealogical records for access to our own data. And this was me starting to go after the New York City Municipal Archives. I overshot a little. <laughs> I knew there was something there that I wanted to get, and that was something most people, even New York researchers, don't know about. It is the New York City Clerk's Marriage Index 1908 through 1929. It was kept by the city clerk originally. It is now at Municipal Archives because it's old. And I only wanted to go after the index because I knew legally that would probably be easier than trying to convince them, you know, the thing I would like to try but haven't tried yet, to go after the microfilms of the certificates. Um, in New York City, there are two different types of marriage-related documents, and people don't really get this. Number one is the one everyone here probably knows about if you got a marriage record. There is a health department certificate. These run through 1937. Italian Gen, which is a nonprofit volunteer genealogy group, made an index to all of these. Again, New York City puts nothing online, so volunteers are doing this and giving the indexes to them and hosting it themselves on their own databases, which is shameful. So if you want to use marriage indexes, you're using our free labor, not the city's, 
to search, for example, to the Steve Morse front end to their website for grooms and brides who are married in New York and the health department certificates through 1937. You get something like this. You can get the bride name. And you will end up with something like this. This is my great-grandparents' marriage certificate. Most people have seen something like this from New York. Page one has, you know, parents' names, where you're from, first marriage, age, blah, blah, blah. Second page is kind of useless. Okay. <laughs> This is what most people think of, but there's a second type of marriage record, and that is the city clerk's records, the ones I wanted to get, because they are kept from 1909 to the present day, and they are three-page documents, they are totally different, and they have more information. The three pages is that the couple had to go to the city clerk to say, I want to apply to get a license, and I will sign an affidavit saying, I'm okay to get a license, I'm not married to anyone else, and I don't have VD, and I'm going to eventually get a certificate, and the three are stapled together, and it's three different sets of handwriting, so you have a lot more opportunities to potentially read a name or a town that was hard to read the first time around. This is the same couple, Nathan and Estelle, and this is page one of their city clerk office doc, uh, records. So you can see this, this is the affidavit. It gives a little more information. It gives where the parents are born. You don't get that on the other one. Second page, the actual certificate filled out by their rabbi. Third page, the license. I believe also sort of part of this is the application sort of with it. The page format changes a little from year to year. I'll go into close-ups in just a sec. Extra awesome things this whole record set has. Bride occupation. Couple cities of birth often, not just always the countries of birth. Parents' countries of birth. Were they widowed? Did either spouse, spouse die? If so, when? Were they divorced? Where was the divorce granted? Like, are you really sure you're really legally divorced? And your home addresses of the witnesses, which helped me in many cases. For example, here is my great-grandmother Esther. She's written as Estelle here. She had an occupation bookkeeper. She worked outside of the house. She's not 22 here, she's lying. Uh, <laughs> but it's nice to see recognition of this sort of thing on this extra inf informative document. The addresses for the witnesses, these are both relatives, and now I have an extra source for them. Um, the bottom of the 1932 license and application explains that, oh, these people both had one previous dead spouse. Uh, my female relative here is lying, she's got two. So, <laughs> but then 1937, they add all these new lines like, what were the grounds for the divorce? Where was it filed? Are you sure you're divorced? And remember, you can't get New York State divorce records for 100 years and they're not covered by FOIL, but you can get this record and this will help you learn about the divorce a little bit. So you always need to look at new places. And 10% more records. This is the most important part because some of these people filed for the application and stuff and didn't get married. Or they filed and for some reason the certificate, the health department certificate, the famous one, never made it to the health department or was mislabeled or something. This is a better source of records. So I'm like, great, where do I sign up? I'm gonna get these records. Problem. They're only on microfilm, they're only downtown New York. It's the only place you can see them. The New York City Municipal Archives won't give them to anybody, they won't let family search index even for free. They are just, no, no, these are mine, mine, mine. You can try to mail order them. They used to be much harder. These days they have to admit they have them. They can't do search on a sound-alike name because they've never been digitized. So you can't search Betty for Elizabeth or Schwartz for Schwartz or anything. And if you go to the archives and they give out the sheet about all the great stuff they have, they don't even list these records on them. So at this point, it's like, all right, these are the ones I'm going after. This is what I'm going to do for my first Freedom of Information lawsuit. Well, I didn't think it was a lawsuit at first. So this is basically a summation of various emails. I did this all over email. You can too. Hi, can you give me all your marriage records all the way up to the present day? And I want them in a database. They're like... No, we don't have them in a database. We only have microfilms. Do you want microfilms? Oh, and we have two different sets. Are you sure you want them? Like, oh, okay, a new email like a week later. Okay, I want the index, and I just want that cool city clerk's office stuff because no one else has it, and I think it should be better known. And they said yes. On official letterhead, they said yes to me. Okay, great. And they gave me a price quote. And then I asked them, okay, how can I pay, and do you take credit cards? And they didn't respond. And I asked again. Finally, they wrote back and like, oh, did we say those were available? I'm sorry, they're not. And like, this is crazy. I'm going to appeal this. So I called the people at Committee on Open Government in New York and like, hi, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you help me? And they were so nice. And they talked to me on the phone for free. And I explained that they didn't know anything about genealogy, but they said, okay, so you're telling me this index 
you could go see it on site at the archive. Like if you walked in the building, you could use it and it would be on microfilm. Like, yeah, but I live in California. I don't want to fly to New York to go look up the index and they're not really good about responding to the mail. And they said, well, if it's available and you've offered to pay, and I can't believe they actually offered you know, to give it to you, like you should get a copy. These are public records. They're a public organization, an agency. I'm like, okay. So I appealed, and the Committee on Open Government wrote a non-binding but very helpful advisory opinion, which they copied me, and they copied the archives and said, yeah, these records should be open. Well, I don't know why you're not giving them to her. These are public records. And the archives said, well, yes, they're public records, meaning you can come here and use them. Like, no, they're public records, so therefore they're part of the Freedom of Information Law, so I can get copies. How can I pay you? And I'm like, oh my God, they're not going to back down. And this was the first place where I started realizing about the difference between learning about the law and learning about what really happens. And what really happens is I had to sue them. I was stonewalled. They didn't follow any procedures. What do you do in that case? Luckily, the law tells you. Every Freedom of Information Law will tell you if they don't follow the rules, here's where you go. And in New York, that's called following a, filing a legal petition. In Article 78, legal petition, basically you are complaining to the Supreme Court of New York, which is not actually supreme in New York, it's mis misnamed. You're telling them, this person didn't follow the rules of their job as a government contractor or government employee, which is like a serious charge. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. I'm going to find someone who's going to help me with this. And I did. And this was one of the hardest parts was, who do you hire for a lawyer? I don't know anything about this. But I found a case that was similar. It wasn't genealogy, but it was similar. There was an artist who lived in New York named Melinda, I want to say Melinda Hunt. That might not be her last name. And she wanted to learn about Hart Island, which is the burial place in New York City for stillbirths and for the indigent. It is Pauper's Field. It is an island and has been that way for hundreds of, like, over 100 years. She wanted access to the death record books of everyone buried there. A couple years ago, she filed a Article 78 legal petition against the Department of Corrections, who own the island and own the books, meaning the jails. And she won. She got access to the books. They made a database. That, rec that information is open. And I thought, you know, that's kind of similar. She got an index, and she got it through this Article 78. I should look up who she used. And I found her lawyer, who was with a new firm, a man named David Rankin, law firm Rankin and Taylor in New York City. I highly recommend them. And they happily took on the case. They're like, yeah, we love doing freedom of information law. This is really important to us. They are like public service laws, really their, their bread and butter. They are all about doing the right thing and fighting the man. So we filed. <laughs> and at this point... I got a little scared, I was like, oh my God, I'm actually gonna be suing New York City. I probably shouldn't put my name on this, but I have to put my name on this, but I'm gonna put on a posse. I have an instant posse. I created a website, because that's what I can do. I created reclaimtherecords.org, as you saw, and I filed with them, even though there, there's really no there there, there's a WordPress site, but they don't care. And we filed against not the municipal archives, but their parent agency, Department of Records and Information Services. Oh, that's an extra slide, sorry. And guess who won? We won a settlement. We were supposed to see them on a Friday in court, and Monday they called my attorney and they said, if we give her the microfilms, will she go away? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, yes. And they sent me copies of the microfilms. <laughs> and this was very gratifying. But now I have a big box of microfilms in my house. <laughs> Like, oh no, who do I talk to about this? Well, I'll tell you. So I cold called, by which I mean emailed, David Runcher at Family Search, who is the head of Family Search. I have no contact with Family Search. I like my coffee. But I wrote to them and I said, hi, I'm filing a lawsuit and I'm about to get a lot of microfilms. Do you want copies? Is what I originally said. Do you guys want copies so that you can put them on your website and put a copy in the Granite Mountain Vault so for the first time ever I know there's a set somewhere other than that one place in downtown New York? And he said, yes, we would love copies and why don't we scan them for you for free and send you back the microfilms and the scanned images on a portable hard drive. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, and they have amazing professional grade microfilm scanners. Not even like the good stuff at the library, but like the real pro stuff. So I forwarded the box to Salt Lake City and they sent it back to me with a big portable hard drive with 80,000 images on them, all professionally done. Beautiful. So thank you, Family Search. That was very generous of them. They didn't need to be doing any of this and that was very kind of them. 
Then I took the images and I put them on the Internet Archive, archive.org. It's not archives.com, which is something else. It's not archives.gov, which is something else. And it's not archives.org, which is also something else. The Internet Archive is basically a place where you can upload anything you want for free. They will host it for you for free. There are no bandwidth bills. There is no logins. There is no paywall. It's not the most beautiful site, honestly, for you know, necessarily paging through stuff, but it's, it's free and it's pretty good and they love hosting stuff. They're, they're a library. I volunteer for them in other capacities to save pages for the Wayback Machine, things like that. So I put everything up there and now it's all up. So this is, I actually don't have a link here. I can probably open up real quick to show you live. This is always ex exciting. <laughs> archive.org slash details slash reclaim the records. And these are their links to this, don't worry, on, um, on our website. And I don't know how good the internet is here. I might have to switch back. And they'll just let you upload whatever you want. They host books. They host music. They host playable versions of the Oregon Trail, if you've ever played that. And here, New York City Marriage Index. If I click here. They have everything. So let's look at 1908 from Manhattan. So the way I got it, there were 48 microfilms, and then each microfilm might have one or two different entries on it by borough and by year. And these are the indexes, and it's loading very slowly, but it will load in here. If you click this little search inside button, you can go through, and it's all handwritten. And this is just exactly what they had. It's exactly what I got. It's brand new microfilms from the masters. So it's slowly, slowly loading. Has the groom side and the bride. Let me scoop down a little further. This covered 1908 through 1929. However, despite that title, the little parts of um, Queens and Staten Island actually extended a little past that year. So you can see by bride they would do it by first by you know Manhattan 1908, and they would do it by surname. You can zoom in. And they will tell you how to get that. This is the index to the three-page documents I was showing you. Once you have this information, there is information on the page here at archive.org to say, I found a name, now what? And we'll say, okay, you have a name. Write down all this stuff. Send it to this address with a check and a self-addressed stamp stamped envelope. Eight to ten weeks, you'll get back the three-page document. So here you go. Now, People are always asking me, is someone going to index these? Yes, I hope so. Person who, people who are working on it right now, or will very, start very shortly, is Italian Gen, the same people who were working on the other one. I would love it if Family Search and Ancestry and MyHeritage and Find My Past and all of these great organizations wanted to do an indexing program too. They're welcome to do it. These images are in the public domain. There are no restrictions. You don't need to ask me. Um, but that's up to them, and I can't make them. So even Family Search, who has a copy of the images, wouldn't even need to start by downloading. I don't know if they're going to put them online. So for now, they're just here. I hope, honestly, as I keep winning more stuff, and I hope I keep winning more stuff, that people will feel comfortable just understanding, like, yes, I'm, there's no strings attached. Just take it. Take the data. So if you go back to the actual main page here, and you scroll down, you'll see all about New York City marriage records, data usage, public domain, and here... I found a name, now what? Got it? Okay, moving on, because we have a lot to cover. <laughs> okay, so that's how we have a process now. Process is I find a record set that no one else has, not even on Family Search Microfilm. I don't care about format. I want something that nobody has and that's important. I make a freedom of information request under the proper law after first researching to make sure, can I actually get this? Is this okay? And usually it is. I fight them until I get the records, and then I put the records online. That's kind of the process now, and now we have a pipeline. Okay, ripple effects from that one case, which was settled September of last year. Guy who I never met before, genealogist in New York, not Jewish, uh, does Dutch and English old New York uh, research, he emails me out of the blue. His name is Bob. He says, hey, I'm researching Gravesend, like old Gravesend, before it was part of Brooklyn, and I keep realizing that the records I want are probably to municipal archives. I never knew that before because, of course, the municipal archives is a restaurant that doesn't publish a menu. So, <laughs> but he realized they must have it. So at, without talking to me, he writes to the email of the people at the municipal archives and says, hi, I hear you have Gravesend records. They're probably on microfilm. By the way, I heard about Brookshire Gans winning her lawsuit against you. <laughs> And he's getting copies now for $35 a film because they can't lie anymore and say this stuff isn't under the freedom of information law. 
So he's getting this stuff, and I told him, oh, oh my God, I'm going to help you put them online as soon as you get them. It's like that's one ripple effect for one guy who has one specific narrow interest. I bet you all have interest in various archives and libraries, too. Next ripple effect, Phyllis Kramer. Some of you may know her, VP of Education at Jewish Gen. Not here today, unfortunately, but she said I could talk about this. She loves voter records. I didn't really know anything about voter records. Some voter records in New York City are kept by the Board of Elections. Some voter records are kept by the Department, uh, by the Municipal Archives. She wrote both groups, Board of Elections and Municipal Archives, letters saying, I'm writing a Freedom of Information request with Brooke Gans, and I'm going to ask you for copies of the voter list for such and such year, such and such area. Board of Elections was great, got back to her right away. She got everything she wanted. Municipal Archives is about to hand over stuff to us. They're giving us the list of everybody registered to vote in the 1924 election in Manhattan. This stuff is public data. We just never thought about it to ask them. Instead of like begging, you should tell them. So we have a sample record that they're working on, but the real ones, this is like the index. It's the list of everyone who was registered to vote in 1924. Women, too, because this is 1924. This is a supplement page. I think the real pages, I, I'm told, will also have political party uh, things, political party affiliations. And the reason this is interesting is because, oh, Jordan has a question. Tell me later. <laughs> okay. The reason this is interesting is because um, this is basically like an index. It's a list of everyone who was registered. In New York City in that time, you had to re-register every year, not just when you moved. So therefore, you can. this is the index to everyone who's registered. You can then ask for a specific person's full one-page form they filled out to prove they're registered to vote on which, and this is why Phyllis wanted it, they say, I became an American citizen on this exact date in this exact court. And if you didn't know that data, you get it in their, in their voter registration, which they had to re-register every year. So if Phyllis and I get from the Municipal Archives the 1924 voter list, you know that your ancestor was a naturalized citizen by then, and you can get their original sheet in their handwriting that they had to fill out. So Phyllis is going further and requesting the entire books um, from two different 80s and EDs, you know, districts um, that cover the Lower East Side. Because to her, that's like a snapshot of Jewish life in 1924. Yes, they have them in shrink wrap in the back of the municipal archives. You can't look at them if you just visit, but you can if you foil them. <laughs> More ripple effects. This case, I didn't need to use the law at all. They just heard about it and were nice, which is cool. Um, <coughs> am I on time? Let me just check. Okay, I'm good. New, York, uh, New Jersey's law is called OPRA, not to be confused with Oprah. Uh, New Jersey State Archives in Trenton, I've never been, but I hear it's wonderful to visit and that they're really helpful to, uh, to genealogists. They have some records that they have an index for. A lot of the records after 1904, they don't even have their own index in a lot of the time. Like you have to sit there and everything is alphabetical within that year. So they don't have an index that I can get for a lot of years, unfortunately. I wish they would make one, they might. But they did have a couple, like birth indexes, grooms index, bride indexes, 1901 to 1914. So I was getting ready to send a records request to them, and I got in touch with the head archivist or someone who knew of me and knew, and knew them, and he was just super nice on the phone. He's like, hey, do you want copies? We'll sell you copies. You don't need to file anything. I'm like, no, no, it's a, Joseph Klett is the head, of the, uh, the head of New Jersey State Archives, and he was just nice. And so they made copies for me, and they sent it to my house, and then I did the same thing where I sent them to Family Search in Salt Lake City. They paid for the shipping, too. And, so, and Family Search was incredibly nice, and they scanned all of the images, and they sent me back the, the actual microfilms and the hard drive. Same deal. It's like kind of turning into a funnel now. And so I'm putting these all on the Internet Archive. Now, a little secret, they're about 98% online already, except for one year where I think I'm having problems with the film. We might need to rerun that one film. That's why it hasn't been announced yet. And they're handwritten, most of them. Not the, the bride's index was often microfilms of an old dot matrix printout. And because it's such high resolution, you may be able to do a text search like unofficially on those. But most of them are handwritten. So these two, someone's going to have to go through and do a laborious indexing job. And again, I wish family search or ancestry or somebody would do them. Um, but that's up to them. And in the meantime, Italian Jim's like, sure, we'll take those. It'll take four years, but we'll do it. I'm like, sure, OK. So this is my big news from this week, or last week, rather. Um, after I got the New York City Marriage Index from the Municipal Archives, those ran through 1929. 
because all the newer stuff is still at the city clerk's office because that's where you go to get married. So I sent a FOIL request on ja in January to the New York City clerk's office and said, hi, you have the New York City marriage index 1930 to the present. I want it. And they didn't respond. And then we sent more emails. Hey, did you get my request? You're supposed to respond in X number of days. They didn't respond. Um, well, I'll get to the, how we did it in a minute. But long story short, we won. <laughs> they settled with us. Um, this, this news just, I was able to finally announce it last week. We are signing the papers this coming week. Cross fingers, my attorney says it's fine to start talking about it now despite not the final stipulation settlement signed. So I'm going on faith that she is correct and they're not going to back out now. Again, they have been due to see us in court many days and they just kept putting it off, putting it off. And then we told them we're not going to give you any more time to put it off. Like just put up or shut up. If you have a reason to tell us no, tell us. But you haven't said why you're saying we can't have it. You haven't said there's some privacy rule. So therefore, by default, they're open. So I want a copy. So that's fun. It's about 3 million records, never before open to the public. Turns out part of it's in microfilm, part of it is in a text database, which is great because we don't have to do an indexing project for those years. The microfilm part and the, um, the database part, they overlap for some years, which is great. We'll have double coverage. So it's the same sort of microfilms we saw before, where they were handwritten index ledgers. Those microfilms, there's 110 of them, run through 1972. But they also made their own for internal use database, which we're getting a copy of in a CSV, comma separated value, like text document file. Um, and that starts in 1950. So from 1950 to 1995, like we'll be able to search it from day one as long as we figure out a way to make a front end for that. The reason is if you try to open that file in Excel, it will crash Excel, I assume. <laughs> um, so I wrote a recent newsletter. Reclaim the Records has a newsletter, and I wrote like the whole how we did it step by step if you want to learn more. Basically involved us explaining to them many times their, um, their responsibilities under the law, which is funny because their FOIL officer is the city, like one of the lawyers for the city of New York, and they kind of blew us off every time until we actually took them to court. That was fun. So, again, snarky commentary on our web feeds. <laughs> we told them, like, flat out what we were doing. This was not secret. We did everything through Muckrock, so our stuff was open to the world. We were not kidding around. It's their fault for not listening to us and not following the law until they had no other recourse. And sometimes that's what you have to do. Okay. How are we doing on time? Okay. More things we're working on. This is not done yet, but you can sort of see what my life is like working on projects like this. On the Reclaim the Records website, we have a record survey where people just, you know, I ask them to write in, do you know about a record set that, like, you would love it if it was online, but it's not online anywhere, and it's not on microfilm, and um, can you tell us more about this? And someone wrote to me saying it would be great to have the Missouri birth index or death index. We don't have either. I'm like, how could you not have anything? Um, but I checked it out one day while I was sitting in my car waiting for a pizza to get made. I ordered it, and I sat in the car until it was ready, and I sat on my phone. All I had to do was Google... Missouri open records laws, Missouri vital statistics laws. I don't know anything about Missouri, but this is how you learn, and you can do it for your state too. And I Googled Missouri vital statistics, and I found it in my car on my little phone, and this is what I found. And if you zoom in, it's basically saying most records in Missouri, unless it's a death record more than 50 years old, then it's open to everyone. But generally, Missouri records, you know, are closed for privacy reasons. Except number one in their list of things that are open is a list of persons who were born or die on a particular date may be disclosed upon request. So I thought, what if I just request every date? <laughs> <laughs> and I did. <laughs> so... Um, so you know, it ta they're supposed to respond. I had to read about the Missouri Sunshine Law. I knew nothing about the Missouri Sunshine Law, but it's not that different from state to state. You just got to read it. They have helpful things online. They have reporters online. There's a big journalism school in Missouri that publishes how to work with the law. And I saw that they're supposed to respond within three days. They didn't respond within three days. About three, four months later, they kind of pushed me off to somebody in the Department of Health. They're like, yeah, we got your request. Um, that's going to be a lot of paper. I'm like, what are you talking about? And it turns out Missouri, yes, they, they do know that they are allowed to give out this index on a day-by-day. -day. It's just a surname, given name, date of birth, or date of death. I tried to ask for, um, can you add the sex? Can you add the certificate number? No. This is like, they'll just do exactly what the law requires them to do. But they've been selling that data for years. They sell it to researchers. They sell it to scientists. They sell it to epidemiologists. So people who want to know who's born in Missouri on a certain day, what's this cohort going on, they'll tell you for a fee. I'm like, 
That can't be right. This says it should be open. Well, it's a fee because we have to have the time to run the request on our really old mainframe, and then they give it to us, and we print it out on paper, and then we scan the papers into a PDF, and we send you the PDF. I'm like, no, 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 you don't, because I'm asking for decades. I'm asking for over 100 years. I'm asking for the birth index 1910 to 2015 and the death index 65 to, 20, to 2015. Like, you're not going to waste that much paper. It's going to take forever. And they said, oh, we do this so that, you know, the pr privacy reasons doesn't, like, get online accidentally. I'm like, no, I want it online. You don't understand. And I also knew from reading the Missouri Sunshine Law that if they have it in a format, you can request it in the same format. They're telling me they have it in a database. I want it in a database. They have to do this. Give it to me on a USB stick. That's all I want. Don't print it. And they kind of weren't listening to me, and they weren't responding. I would call their office every week, and they'd put me off. And eventually, again, this is where you see the difference in what the law says and what you actually have to do. And what I actually had to do was find a Missouri Sunshine lawyer. I told him this story, and he's like, sure, I'll help. And because he called, they made a response. It wasn't a good response, but at least it was a response with an invoice because they've admitted I have the right to them. They just didn't say how much it would cost, but then they did. <laughs> this was the email I got from Missouri. Can you imagine what I thought when I got this email? Now, I'm not on the hook for this. This is just they're telling me what it would cost if I got this. And honestly, they're doing it this way because they purposely misunderstand that they're going to run every single day one by one. They're going to do one for April 1st, one for April 2nd, and so on, which they're listing at 23,376 hours just for the births. That is if you work 24-7, 2.5 years. This is ridiculous. This is insane. This is already open in the law. There is no reason for this. Luckily, this is why you have an attorney. And our attorney wrote him some letters saying, how can this be possible? By the way, don't you know, under Missouri law, if you have it in the database, you have to give it in a database. You know, this is established law. And by the way, Missouri is one of those states where they have fines if they mess up and they know that they're breaking the law. And I think he sort of mentioned to them, you don't want to get fined, right? Because I'm telling you, this is an attorney, a well-known Missouri Sunshine Law attorney, right? He, by the way, is the attorney who um, is dealing with the Missouri Sunshine Law case to the Missouri Supreme Court to ask about the materials being used in lethal injections in Missouri, which Missouri doesn't want to tell anyone where they're sourcing the chemicals from. And he, of course, is saying, no, the public has the right to know. So he's a well-known guy. Um, <laughs> so yeah. And they're like, oh, well, you know, here's why we can't do it. We can't do it this way because we have an old mainframe. So we can't do search all birth dates from this date to this date. We can't. We just, you know, we use SAS. It's like a really old language. And this is what they're telling this attorney. And like, this is insane. Right. No, it's, I mean, I know it's old fashioned. I know they have a very old mainframe, but still they have to give it. And if they have to find someone who's not on their staff, who has the specialized, infer the specialized ability to dump it to a USB key on a one-time job, I will pay for that person's hours. They're entitled to charge me. I'll pay for it. I'm not asking for nothing, something for nothing. So they tell me SAS just can't do a search on like that. But they did tell me it was SAS. So I look online. I don't know anything about SAS, but I found their contact us number, and I found their tech support number. And I called them up, and I didn't tell them I did work for Missouri Department of Health, but I didn't tell them I didn't work for Missouri Department of Health. <laughs> I said I was working with the Missouri Department of Health database, and could you do a search on multiple dates with, like, one search? Like, search from this date to this date, export to a file, put it on a stick. And they're like, of course you can do that. Like, how, how dare you? Yeah, I know. It's like a line of code. Like, how dare you impugn our database system? You know, it's wonderful. So I we write back to the Missouri people. I'm like, no, no, you can do this. And then we have proof that you can do this. Would you like the tech support number? Here it is. And that's when they write back to us and tell us, this was a misunderstanding. <laughs> so they finally write back. And they're going to keep refining this. Because at this point, they're still doing one search per year. But... <laughs> Like, come on, you can do one search for multiple years at once. I know you can. So they're going to keep looking at this and get like a more reduced rate. Eventually, they'll get it down to the actual cost, send us an invoice, and hopefully by end of this year, 2016, we will get the Missouri birth index and death index and put it online. And they'll never charge again. <laughs> so, so that is my life these days. It is working with the government or against the government. Um, New York State. New York has an open data portal like many other places. Um, this is New York and New York. For has, as bad as they are about not making things available and being terrible to deal with, they do have a small amount of data on their op genealogical data on their open data portal. And it is 
the 1957 through 1965 death index for New York State, which is, of course, separate from the city because they're separate vital records jurisdictions, which they update quarterly. It's like, guys, that's awesome. Good for you. What about... But like, if you have everything 57 to 65 and you're adding to it as the year goes on, so this year will be 66, I think, like, what about pre-1957? Now, New York State does publish that as open data, not as open data, as open records. Let me see if you can realize how this is very similar to my New York City case. If you're in New York State and you want to look at some, the record, the death index for someone who died in 1930 or 50 in Yonkers or somewhere like that, you can go to a small number of New York State libraries, only the libraries. You go in, they take like your phone and your pen and stuff. I haven't actually done this, but I hear about it. And you can view microfiche. So yes, the records are open, but they're only in a specific location, a couple specific locations in New York, and they're only in a really old format. And I'm like, oh my God, this is the same as my New York City case all over again. It's just the New York State Department of Health owns these. I'm going to request these. So that's what I'm working on now. And we've been sort of stymied on various issues. Um, just to put it out there, like they were trying to get us to pay for the actual cost of microfiche to microfiche transfer. But because I had asked originally from microfiche to digital, which is a thing that you can do because we have a machine that can do it, that's a lot less expensive. So we're sort of like been hung up and it's been on pause while we finish the other stuff. But we're hoping by end of the year we get the rest of this death index, the older stuff. Because they kind of had to admit, well, if you're already publishing this mid-century stuff, how can you withhold 1900 death index? Um, and it's shameful that New York State does not have... A death index, like they don't themselves, for their own use. You have to look up the exact spelling of the name, which of course was transcribed and typed, you know, 50 years ago from a handwritten certificate. This should all be out there. And it's not just that we're the only one who ever thought of this. Everybody thought of this. Family search, ancestry, all the big companies, not just genealogy, but people who deal with them. Um, you know, like basically public data for other reasons, insurance, things like that. They've all been after New York for years. And New York just says, no, 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 we won't do a deal. We won't. No, no, it's on microfiche. No. Or they just drag their, their heels in other ways. And finally, we kind of have a hammer that will break through that wall. So we're hoping by end of the year that we won't have to take them to court. We will if we have to. But, you know, you know, this is what we're doing just to go. And we're going after the death index first because I figured low-hanging fruit, go for the stuff they're going to have the least number of problems with. Dead people don't have privacy rights. So getting a list of dead people's names from, like, 1880 to 1956 shouldn't be a problem. I didn't think it would be as hard as it is. But once we get it, the exact same rationale will give us access to the other records that are in those New York State libraries, like the marriage index, which we can get all the way to 2015, the birth index, which is apparently like through the 30s, because that birth indexes are really tricky. You don't want to infringe on people's privacy, but it's just the index to their names, and they're already public records. It's just not accessible public records. So that's the kind of stuff I work on. I'm testing the waters on access to educational records, like school records. Like, this will go down on your permanent record. There really are permanent records all around the country. And a lot of school districts have records retention policies that say you have to hold on to these for 100 years. So I'm starting to test with, like, little things to the New York City Department of Education and other places. Hi, you have a record for my great-grandmother. Can I have a copy? She's dead, so shouldn't be a problem, right? So, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but you have to try testing. I'm not going to, like, sit around and wait for them to do it, because they're not. Um, so, yeah, this one is from my great-grandmother again. I purposely didn't say she was dead, because I wanted to see if they would realize she must be dead. I want to see how dumb they were going to be. <laughs> like, I don't know what's going to happen, but you have to try somehow. I also made a FOIL request to the New York City Department of Education, not for a person's records, but for a school's records. But I found and read the records retention schedule for the New York City Department of Education and says prior to like 1950 or so, every school had something called an all-school census, which is like the directory. It's every kid who is in the school, what grade they're in, their class list, their attendance list, their parents' names, their home address, their grades, like uh, all this sort of stuff. So some of it's probably too intrusive. You can't get their grades, if they're obviously, if they're still alive. But parent, list, parent names are actually part of the directory, legally. Now, there is a federal law called FERPA, which would come into play, too, which protects you know, privacy rights around these records. But FERPA generally doesn't apply to dead people, or it's not supposed to. I don't know if New York realizes that. And FERPA is not supposed to apply to basic directory listening. So I don't know what's going to happen. Let's find out. I'm still working on this. this. Maybe next year I'll have more information. 
Nice screenshot again of our website. So this is where you can come in to start thinking about what records you want. It shouldn't just be, oh, you did great stuff, good job getting those records. You can get the same records. You can do the same thing with whatever part of the country you care about. You just have to do a lot of research, that's all. And, and you know, don't be surprised if they try to do really ridiculous stuff. Just, you know, just it, roll with it. We have a record survey on our website where you can tell us about records that you know exist, not like ones you wish exist, but you know that they exist somewhere and you just can't get access to them. Like, oh, there's a naturalization book at the library, but people aren't allowed to look through it, only the librarian can look through it, so I can't see the index. So that's a problem. Or, oh, there's, you know, these old records of, like, employment records from the city employment records, the public employment records from, like, the 1920s. Or, oh, there's this. Or why does this state not have anything? Um, and we put them on our to-do list. We research every one of them before we put on the to-do list. We're only putting things up that we really think we would have a decent shot of getting. It's not like we want to do a scattershot approach. So we have like 63 items on this list already. You can see what we're going to eventually be working on. We'll announce more all the time. OK, getting to the end here. And I'm going to take your questions very soon. So why do you do all this? Why do you like to beat your head against the wall and fight the government, fight City Hall? Well, it's because you should not be, as a researcher, you should not be assuming that your records are going to be coming to you magically. They do not drop in the dead of night. They, the governments, the agencies, I do feel a little bad for them. Honestly, they don't have the budget to do a lot of this stuff. They don't have the budget to put a lot of stuff online. They have to deal with government uh, um, contractors if they ever wanted to put something online and cost overruns. They are feeling like they need to justify their existence. And by holding on to the only copy of records, it gives them power. And so they're not necessarily going to be proactive. So you can't assume they're going to do the right thing. They might, but they probably won't. And they probably can't, even if they are good people inside there. Same with libraries. The for-profit genealogy companies, I'm a member of all of these different sites. I pay ridiculous fees every year. I think there's a place for them. But they have become kind of the only venue to get new record sets online by making often exclusive deals with all these various city and state governments. And that's messed up. There's no other way to put it. Now, I understand that it benefits both sides. They want to make a profit. That they're a company. That's what they are. And then the libraries need money. That's what they do. So. You know, it sort of benefits all of them, but where does it benefit us? Does it benefit us if everything's behind a paywall for five years or ten years or forever? No. Um, even some of our favorite large and small nonprofit genealogy companies can't often do this. And the reason is they have to be incredibly protective of their name, their reputation. They don't want anyone ever thinking, they came in here and took our records and put them online. They're going to do this, this, and this with them. Like, they, like, have to be super nice. And... Even if they're being treated badly, which they often are by these archives, like they are not going to go be the bad cop. So if we are all the bad cop, they can be the good cop, which is fine by them and fine by me. And sometimes even individual genealogists, sometimes we're our own worst enemies. We're always looking for our records, our grandmother's record. Where's my great-grandfather? And we're so narrowly focused, we forget about the entire record set that is there that could benefit everyone if we only took a little more time to open it. Not just one record, but the set. So that is why there is no records fairy. You can be the records fairy <laughs> if you want to be. Finally, I would tell you to use these freedom of information laws because we can, because we are lucky to have them. They are an underused tool. And they are mostly free unless you run into terrible people, which you might. Maybe I was just unlucky, but maybe, maybe you'll be lucky, or maybe you'll find someone who realizes they have to open the law and they'll work, um, let records under the law and they'll work with you. So we have these laws. No one else is going to be using them except for individuals, so individuals should use these laws because look what you can do for a little bit of money. You can get everything open to you forever. God bless America. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, questions. <laughs>